Good morning, or afternoon, or right somewhere in between there-ish. How's everyone doing? Isn't the presence of God an amazing thing? We were running up to the, to the, to the North Campus, and uh, Brian was with me, and we got there to the door to go into the sanctuary. He was like, Do you, wanna, you got a couple minutes here, you want to go to the green room? And you could, I could feel God's presence on the door. Like, it was like, I felt like the... I felt like the door was alive. <laughs> it was like, behold, I set before you an open door. I felt like that, you know? It was just like, it's such a powerful prayer. And I stepped in there, and I was just like, Whew. have you ever had that happen where you just, you just step into God's presence, and it's just like, everything's fine. It's not, but it is. That's how I, that's how I, I, I felt. If it's okay... My name is Jeff Garner. I uh, live in San Francisco, pastor in, in San Francisco. I come here as often as I can because I love Papa Mike, Mama Kathy, Amy, and Stacy, Pastor Amy, Pastor Stacy. I just, and I love you. You have such a beautiful spirit. So as somebody that comes in from the outside, can I just say some of the things that I notice from, like I get to come in every once in a while, and I, can, I have like a 30,000-foot view, that the things that I get to see from someone that walks in. First thing, God's presence. Your wor- the worship is authentic. And, and I, every time, without fail, I sense the presence of God. It reminds me of probably what it would have been like to have been in the upper room. And, and when, this, when the spirit fell, do it. I, think it, I think you're a lot like the Jerusalem church in that regard. Like it's, like, an, it's like a constant upper room, just presence, beautiful, beautiful presence. It's so rich. And I, I pray, you know, I pray you don't take it for granted. Sometimes we, it's so familiar, we don't, we don't realize, you know, what's happening. But let somebody from the outside that comes in say it to you. You are blessed with God's presence. <laughs> Something else I notice is the diversity. Just look down the row. I mean, there is nobody like you on that row. And that's a good thing. Such incredible, you know, diversity of age, diversity of skin color, diversity of ethnicity, diversity of socioeconomic backgrounds, diversity from all walks of life, of education. This is the kingdom of God. This is it. This is what Jesus dreamed of. This is it. This reminds me of probably what it would have been like to have worshiped in a church in Antioch in the first century. They had this. You are a lot like the church at Antioch. And that's just me coming from the outside in and I can see it and it's beautiful. Two more things I've noticed. I know, you're like, please stop. No more. That's what my dad always says when I'm, no more compliments, son. Uh, two more things I've noticed about, about covenant. The, the, the third thing is, without fail, every time I'm here, I, I, I'll look out and people have notepads out and they have a pen or they have their Bibles opened or they have their, their, their phone and they're taking notes on their phone and you are into the word. Like you are so into learning and growing and becoming and you realize you can't do it without the word of God. And so you're just in it. And that reminds me of another church in the book of Acts. If we keep going here, I'll make my way through the entire book of Acts. In Acts chapter 17, the apostle Paul leaves Thessalonica and he journeys down to Berea. And Luke tells us that the people in Berea were more noble, which means open-minded. They were more open-minded than the people in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily to see if the things that Paul was saying were true. They had a love for scripture. They loved it. They were searching and searching and searching. You ever notice that we don't have an epistle to the Bereans? We have no epistle to the Bereans. You know why? Because epistles were written to problems. 
The Corinthians had a lot of problems. Rome had a lot of problems. Thessalonica had a lot of problems. The Galatians and the Philippian and the, and the church at Philippi and the church at, at uh, Ephesus and Colossae, problems. Paul's like, oh no, a problem. I gotta write another letter. And I'm so grateful they had problems because we get books that we can read today from that. But the Bereans didn't have any problems. They, so we don't have an epistle to them. You remind me of the church, Berea. And finally, I think, uh, when, I, when, I, when I think of the leadership of this church, I think of um, what it probably was like to be a part of the Apostle Paul's entourage, you know. I mean, could you imagine if you're, you know, amongst a group of leaders that Luke, who writes Luke and Acts, Silas, Barnabas, Mark, Priscilla, Aquila, Fififomilla, <laughs> such an incredible band of leaders, Timothy, Titus. It says a lot when you have, when there's a collective of leadership that can work together like that, and I see that here. What a blessing. Man, it's like we're in the book of Acts, <laughs> right here. It's such a joy to be with you today, and... Um, Pastor Amy is going to be speaking next Sunday, and she'll be talking about how to study the Bible, how to read the Bible, how to get the most out of the scriptures. And I'll be watching online to see it because it's going to be awesome. I want to kind of set it set up. So even though she didn't say this, this is kind of like a two-part sermon series. I'll give the first part. I want to kind of set this up. Uh, here today, just by talking about kind of the kind of questions that we approach Scripture with and how to do that. And, and I think maybe, um, I just, let me just share with you a little bit about just about my story. Now, a lot of people talk about when they were, you know, kids, they asked Jesus into their heart. I didn't do that. I actually begged him because at five years of age, I thought that I was the chiefest of all sinners, you know, I had committed, I had a rap sheet of sin. I'm not sure what it was, but you know, I just felt like it. And it seemed in our church that like it was absolute, well, the point that we were at, hell was about to open up and swallow us all. And I was, I was certain that I was going down. And I grew up in a Pentecostal church and we had the pews, you know, and uh, underneath the we had church Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. I see some of you looking at each other like, oh, I know, this, I know where this guy comes from. <laughs> Saturday, twice on Sunday, 5 a.m. prayer. Whew, I feel like I, I was just a church walking around as a five-year-old. That's what I was. <laughs> but I, I had one particular sin that, I was, that nobody knew about, and it was my secret sin. Five-year-olds were allowed to sleep underneath the pews, and during church service, because it would go so long, you know? And so, so there I'd, I'd bring my blanket and I would get underneath the pew and I'd, I would sleep under the pew. And, uh, and my sin was that I had a, we were not allowed to have candy or gum in church. But under that pew, I had located a piece of gum and I put it right there. And I, I looked forward to it every church service. We couldn't have any gum, but I could. And nobody knew about it. And I don't think anybody was gonna try it. And so we, they, you know. <laughs> so, you know, there was this moment where it was one of those hellfire brimstone services and, and I was half awake, half asleep. And then it dawned on me, I'm going to hell. And my sin was right there plastered on the pew in front of me. And there it is, I've hidden the gum from mom. I can't, and I got out from beneath that pew and I started crying. I was begging my mother, I've got to be baptized. I've got to be baptized. I'm five years old. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna go to hell. It's over. It's, I'm done. I'm evil. I did get baptized that night. But the thing about growing up in a culture like that and the thing about coming to Christ in that kind of a culture is whatever we are one with, we are one to. And if you win someone with fear, 
you win them to fear. If you win somebody with love, they are one to love. So my story was pretty much all about fear. Constantly, I was afraid of God, constantly afraid that I wasn't good enough. I didn't get it right enough. And by the time I was 17, I was going to college and, and to, to study for, for ministry. And there I was my first year, my freshman year, I'm going to school. I got my first like big job. I was stocking groceries at the grocery store. I, you know, 17 year old, I'd gone from driving a beer truck to seriously to stocking groceries. And here I am stocking groceries, and there was a guy that worked in the frozen food section, much older than me. He was, his name was Eddie, and he was Buddhist. And I was like, he's my mission. I'm going to win him. And I tried everything I could. But then I noticed some things about Eddie. Eddie. It gave me, like, serious concern. He, he was nicer than a lot of my friends at church. He was kind. And this was messing with my theology. And I started having a, a, faith, a, a faith crisis. Like, would God send Eddie to hell? He's a sweet guy. He's not like <laughs> so-and-so at church. They're evil. I was like, are they going to get to go to heaven? So this conundrum led me to a place where I, was, I have to do something about it. And when I was, during, my, during my, the summer of my freshman year, I decided I'm going to go on a fast. So I went on this fast. I drove my Jeep up into the Sierras, drove way back in on a dirt road, pulled out a tent, set it up. I had nothing but my Bible. I had my water and my Bible, and I was going to go on a long fast. And me and God, we were going to get to the bottom of this, and I was going to ask God some questions, and he was going to show up, you know, because he showed up to Jesus when he was in the wilderness, and he showed up to Moses when he was in the wilderness, and Elijah. So this, this was my time. There's Moses and Elijah and Jesus and Jeff. <laughs> we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get this answered. I've got questions. God's going to answer. Nothing happened the first night or the second, or the third, or the fourth, or the fifth, or the sixth, or the seventh, or the eighth, or the ninth, or the tenth. I got all the way to about day 18. And I was like, I know what's going on here. I haven't showed God that I want it bad enough. So I decided that I had read the story about Jacob, you know, wrestling with the angel. I was like, I'm gonna have me one of those things tonight. Lord, you and I, we're meeting out backside of the mountain here, and I am not letting go until you bless me. I'm gonna stay out there, I'm gonna wrestle. I've got some questions, and you need to show up with some answers. I'm your man now. I need to know. Give me the answer. And so I, there I went, 10 o'clock at night. I thought I'd start late, and that would be an all-night prayer. That was kind of the idea. That's what I was thinking on the front end. 11 o'clock. I was like, I don't know if this was such a good idea. Midnight. I mean, it's, it's, I'm alone. There's no one out here in the middle of the woods. I don't know what I'm thinking. I've had nothing but water for a couple of weeks, and here I am. Oh, but God honors sacrifice. Here we go. One in the morning, no angels, no God, no crickets, nothing. And then, folks, I am not exaggerating this one bit. <clears throat> yes, just like that. It wasn't God, it was something in the bush. And I was like, Lord, I ain't waiting for whatever that is. I know David killed the, the bear and that. I'm not David. I'm going to my tent. We can talk about this tomorrow morning when I wake up. <laughs> I hightailed it. I ran into a barbed wire fence, cut myself up. I, I didn't care. There's no way I'm wrestling with the bear. I can wrestle with God all night long, but I am not wrestling with the bear. Get into the tent. That trip after those, after those 21 days, I got in my Jeep, and I didn't have an angel. I didn't have God appear. There was nothing. There was nothing. The heavens were silent. I got in my Jeep. I was driving down the mountain, and I realized I had something. But it wasn't what I, what I was asking. I had faith for the first time in my life. Up to this point, 
I had put my faith in answers. Up to this point, I had put my faith in my doctrine, put my faith in what I believe, put my faith in how well I could answer someone. Up to this point, it was all about everything that I knew, and I would believe what I knew. But right here in this moment, I realized I just believe because I know God to be good. I don't understand. I've got a lot more questions than I had even before I got up here. But right now, I have faith. I have faith in God. I trust God. And then I realized something. You can't have faith without a question. You don't get faith with answers. You've got the answer. And here's the thing. The reason why you have faith is because you experience God's presence in that moment. And the thing is, most of us don't want proof about God. We don't want 10 proofs for the existence of God. We want an experience of God's presence. That's what we want and that's what we get. And when you get that, that's all that matters. And it kind of reminds me of the story of Job, you know? He's got all these questions. He's gone through his, all of his losses and his trials and he's Job. He's the proverbial Job. The, the real one, not the proverbial one. And he comes to his store and he's asking all of these questions and his friends show up. And guess what his friends bring? Answers. Here's why this is happening. Here's why this is happening. Here's why this is happening. They have tons of answers. One answer right after another. And in fact, you get to Job 35 and his last friend, Elihu, says to Job, you say that I am in the right, not God. So he's like, he's gonna start spouting off on him. And then he goes on, Elihu goes on and says, so Job opens his mouth with empty talk, without knowledge, he multiplies words. This is Elihu saying what Job does. Job's empty and all of his friends are giving answers. And then this goes on for you know, another two chapters. And then we get to Job 38. And God shows up. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm and said, now here's where we think we're gonna get a bunch of answers. Finally, someone's gonna show up with an answer. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? By the way, when God asks a question, that's not the time to answer. You just shut up and let him ask. <laughs> you no, know, what were you saying? Hey, oh Lord, stop right there. Let me answer that question first. I know the answer, I got it. Ooh, pick me, pick me. No, you just shut up. You just be, I will question you, brace yourself like a man and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Folks, this is what we call a rhetorical question. There is no answer to this. You listen and you experience God speaking to you. Here's the point. And just for the next couple of minutes, this is what I'm gonna talk about. The question is the answer. The question is the answer. Have you noticed that the first time God has a conversation with us humans, it's a question? Adam, where are you? Now, that's not because God's like thinking, man, shoot, I put him here last night and I can't find him for the life of me. Where'd that guy go? It's not like, Adam, Ollie, Ollie, all come free. Hide and go seek. You know, that's not what's going on here. God is asking a question because he wants Adam to think about where he is in relationship to who God is. Where are you? He's also asking him that question because he wants Adam to have a conversation and start with confessing. I hid myself. He wants Adam to pray. He wants Adam to come close. He wants Adam to recognize the existential crisis that he is in. Where are you? Where are you? How many of you ever felt that way in your life? Where am I? Where am I right now? What's going on? And God's there the whole time going, where are you? Where are, 
I'm right here where I've always been. Where are you? Not spatially. Where are you relationally? What about this question? Who told you that you were naked? I tried this one on my daughter when she was in seventh and eighth, uh, seventh grade in junior high. Dad, I want these shoes. I've just got to have these shoes. I must have these shoes. Everyone in my class has these shoes. And I decided I'd get really theological. And I thought it would work well. It, in my head, it seemed to, like it would work out a lot better than what actually happened. And I said to her, Jerusalem, who told you that you were naked? And she was like, what? I just want shoes. Ah, but this is, this is a truth. It's a question that we all have to face. We're covering ourselves up with our job or our entertainment or busy, just so busy, super busy. I got this going on and I'm just covering myself up with, keep myself pursuing another degree. Got to get that other degree. I'm covering myself up with my status, with my money, with this, with that. Covering, 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 covering. And he's like, who told you that you were naked? You don't need that. All you need is me. Who told you? Right? It's a powerful question. Yeah. What about this question? Where is your brother Abel? Like he knows where Abel is. It's not that God's like, man, you guys are just hanging out over here in church service, both of you, offering up sacrifices. What happened? He knows his blood is crying out to me from the ground. Do you know where he is? That question's like, I love that boy. I love Abel. Where is he? What about this one? Moses. What's in your hand? Oh, nothing. Just my staff for the sheep. Look, God, I can't, I'm not going back to Egypt. I'm not going to lead your children out. I'm not going to do anything like that. That's not my thing. I can't, I can't talk. I can't, I can't talk. I, I can't do it. I, get, I quit. I'm just a shepherd. I, I love sheep. They're dumb and they follow me wherever I go. I am not going back to Egypt and taking Israel out. I can't do it. I, have, I don't have the skill set. I don't have the tools. What's in your hand? It's just a staff. You can't lead people with a staff. Moses, here's the thing you gotta understand. You're not gonna lead them. I am. What's in your hand? It's just a pencil. What's in your hand? It's just a water bottle. What's in your hand? I don't know, what is it? What's in your hand? I can't, I can't get involved in ministry. I can't help out at Covenant. I can't do anything. I, I don't have the skill. I don't have the, I don't, I can't, I don't, I don't. what's in your hand? Just take what you have, give it to me. I am the one that will do it through you. What's in your hand, David? Five smooth stones and a slingshot. Come on, Goliath. What's in your hand? It's a beautiful question that provokes us to do something with our life. What about this one? What are you doing here, Elijah? In the Hebrew, it's, who are you here? Now, there's, a, there's a difference. I know who you were on Mount Carmel. I knew who you were when you were in, you know, up there doing your prophetic ministry up there in Northern Israel. But right now you're down here where Moses' ministry was in the wilderness. Who are you here? In fact, you have your own wilderness in Damascus that you're supposed to be in. You're trying to build your own story in somebody else's story. You have your own. Get up to the other wilderness, that's yours. Who are you here? You're not supposed to be here. He's standing in the same cave that Moses was in when Moses had the, well, hid in the cleft of the rock. He's like, this isn't, this isn't, you've got another, who are you here? What about this one? Isaiah, the Lord speaking. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? I love Isaiah's response. Here I am, Lord, send me. Or what about Jonah? Is it right for you to be angry? The question is the answer. The question provokes you to think. 
the question gets you off your laurels and gets you engaged with really living life. Otherwise, you can walk around kind of robotically. You're just kind of hypnotic. You're not really in it. You're not really present. You're not really, you're just kind of just going through the motions. But God's questions awaken us to think deeply. Have you ever noticed how Jesus leads one question after another? Does anyone here have a coin? Whose image is on the coin? Render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's, unto God the things that are God. I mean, it's just one question after another. What about this question? Who do men say that I am? Woo! That, it gets even better. Who do you say that I am? Oh. How about this one? Simon, son of John, do you love me? Lord, you know. You know I love you. He does. He does know that Simon loves him. He absolutely knows it. But Simon doesn't know it. Simon's riddled with guilt. Simon needs to confess it three times. Simon needs to hear himself say it, not for Jesus' sake. Simon has to hear himself say, I love you, I love you, I love you. It's a conversation, it's prayer. And it starts with a question. Because here's the thing, there is no quest without a question. You'll never get going if you don't have a burning question deep inside of you. I would say those questions, I would say my life, the most significant movements in my life have been catapulted by an existential question or by a spiritual question that I couldn't find the answer for. And I never did get the answer that I was asking. I got something always far greater, far greater than an answer. I encountered God in a brand new way each time. The quest is always based on a question. How about the Magi? Where is he who is born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come here to worship. They had a question and they traveled. They got on a quest to pursue an answer to that. And it brought them to the little baby Jesus where they bowed down and they worshiped. A question brought them into a place of worship. Questions bring us into places of awe. They bring us before God as this great mystery that knows everything and we know so little in comparison and we don't know what to do so we just stand there in awe. Like Abraham Heschel said, some asked for wealth and some asked for, for knowledge and some asked for status. I asked for wonder. I wanted to stand in the presence of God with my jaw dropped open, my eyes wide ablaze in God's glory and just be completely in awe of God. That's worship. You can worship God with the question. The woman coming to Jesus, will you please heal my daughter? She is vexed by a demon. And she worshiped him with a question. So questions shape the answer. Oh, I'm just gonna, I'm just, I'm watching you take those notes right there and I am just so inspired. Dear God have mercy. You're writing that whole thing down. <laughs> yes, the question shapes the answer. If you ask the wrong question, you're gonna get the wrong answer. In 2003, I was watching a documentary of a kid who had been arrested and was being interrogated for murder. He was 15 years old and he was being accused of a murder in Florida. I think it was in Jacksonville, Florida. Watching this documentary did something to me so much that I mean, I, have, I just can't forget it. They start off with the questions of like, how did you do it? Where did you kill him? Why, why did you kill the tourist? What provoked you to do that to him? And he was first starts off saying, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. And then he starts sobbing. He's just a kid, real quiet, meek kid. He starts sobbing. He said, I did. I finally confesses that he killed him. He signs a confession. Well, come to find out, he didn't do it. He was at home the whole time. He was so scared. 
He just didn't know how to, how to talk. He was a 15-year-old. They were asking the wrong questions. Instead of asking him, did you kill, they're asking him, why did you do it? Well, that, it's possible that we can come to the Bible in the same kind of way, that we can pick up the Bible and ask it questions that it's not answering. This is not a medicine cabinet for all of your ills. It is a story about how God went to great lengths to save people like me and you. It's a story, but it's not just a medicine cabinet. You're like, I wanna have the perfect family, I shall go here. You're gonna have to read past a lot of people that did not have perfect families, I'm sorry. I mean, the favoritism of Isaac towards Esau, I mean, that, that is a classic psychological disaster waiting to happen, and it does. Jo Jacob turns around, he does that to his son Joseph, and then they hate him and they beat him up. There are no perfect families here. So if you're coming here thinking, I'm gonna get the perfect family, then, Papa Mike and I would like to see you after service. We would like to sign you to a book deal. We will write a book on perfect families with you, telling your story. We'll just put the words to it. But if you are broken, if your life has fallen apart, if things just haven't come together like you thought they would, you can pick this up. It was written for that. And you can ask it questions. How do I get started again? How do I get back to where I once was? How do I recover my life and redeem my life again? It's here. That answer is here. So what questions are you asking when you go to the Bible? Pastor Amy next week is gonna tell you how to dig into it. I'm just saying Questions are the place I kind of start. It's a place where you should start. But beware of the questions you are asking. I'm gonna give you four questions not to, to go to the text with, okay? You ready? The first one is, is questions that are based upon ethnocentricity, ethnocentric questions. You don't go to the Bible and you say, how do I make whatever it is, the best in the world, my ethnicity. And you look at here in uh, Acts chapter one, this is what the disciples do. They come to Jesus and they say to Jesus, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He's like, haven't I been with you for three years? Boys, we are on to building God's kingdom, not Israel's. Like this is a whole new thing. I have sheep in other folds. I have sheep in Rome. I have sheep in Macedonia. I have sheep in Egypt. I have sheep all over, the, all over the known world. I am not just about this little sliver of land right here. My heart is too big. You're asking a very narrow question and I am not answering that. We are here to build the kingdom of God. Are you ready? On three. That's the question I'm answering how to build God's kingdom. Next question you don't wanna ask is questions that are time-centered. Will you at this time return? Are you going to come this week? Lord, are you gonna return this week? Are you gonna do this right now? God does, not op God does not operate in your limited purview of chronology, but he is everywhere in your kairos. And kairos is that Greek word that says now, this moment. Like, don't be worried about a week from now, two weeks from now, a year from now. You know, well, God, right now. The writer of Hebrews says, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Now, here, this moment. Take a big, deep breath with me. Just that breath, that's where God is. You don't, the power of the gospel is you don't need anything beyond Jesus' presence in this moment, right here, right now. 
Your guilt can be washed away. Your shame can be dealt with. Your fear can be absolved. All of that disruption and chaos that's going on inside of your mind and your heart. In one instance, God can break through to you right now. The kingdom of God is in the now. It's in the present. It's in this moment. It's right here. Eyeball to eyeball, heart to heart. God is right here, right now with you. There is nothing that stands between you and God except your doubt. That's it. And the moment you go, I believe he's there. So don't answer questions that are chronocentric and then don't ask questions that are egocentric. Who's gonna be the greatest? <laughs> Lord, we're just having a discussion with all the elites of the disciples, you know. We're trying to figure out who's gonna sit on the right hand and who's gonna sit on the left hand. He's not answering that question, folks. He is answering the question of, how do I have a servant's heart? How do I have the faith like a little child? How do I take up somebody else's burden and care for them? How can I give? How can I share? How can I elevate someone else? That's the question that he is answering. So the scriptures can speak to that. And finally, don't ask questions that are centered on um, what we call proof texting. Like you already know the answer and you're just going to the Bible to prove your point. So this is what we've relegated the word of God to. I have all of my opinions. I've just got a couple of scriptures to back them up. <laughs> oh, okay, folks, this is dangerous. You, when I pick this up in the mornings and I'm reading it, I am not going, okay, I gotta prove. I look at this and I'm like, transform me, change me. This is a mirror. You know, God's word is supposed to change me. I'm not supposed to change it to what I want it to say. Change me, make me better, make me purer, wash me. That's what this is for. Not, I've got some ideas and I've got some scriptures to back it up. All right. Just want to close with this. Um, during our research for Real Happy, um, Pastor Mike and, and, and I were researching, and I came across this theologian by the name of uh, Jurgen Moltmann. He had written a tiny little book, probably this, just tiny. It was called Theology of Joy. Man, I bought that thing right up. And I, I knew of him because he's considered to be one of the greatest theologians of the past century. And so I, I picked it up, but man, it was pretty dense. I'm not recommending it. It's just a dense read, very dense. It was just like, whew. It took me like weeks to get through that little, that little. But I, but I did fall in love with him. I fell in love with his heart and how he was articulating that God's all about joy and you know, really theologically working through it. As we started working on the next project, Hope, I knew that that was his subject. He has written like dozens of books on hope and he is considered to be the theologian of hope. And I was like, I, 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 wanna, I wanna get into him. And I barely got into the first book and he started telling his story. Jürgen Moltmann was a 16 year old kid. He was atheist, he was born in Germany, raised in Germany during World War II. At 16 years of age, he was in school. The Nazi party broke into his room. They conscripted all the students to be part of the, of the, the war. And so there he was in Hamburg. Him and his buddies went out, and he was put behind an anti-aircraft artillery machine. And uh, a couple months later, during Operation Gomorra, when, the U, uh, when Britain came over and bombed Hamburg, Hamburg went up in smoke. 40,000 people were instantly killed. His best friend, who was standing next to him from school, had his head blown off. He said, my dad was an atheist, my mom, my whole family. I said, I had never thought about God one day in my life. But standing behind that anti-aircraft machinery, I looked up to heaven, and for the first time in my life, I said, where are you, God? There was nothing but carnage all around me. Three years later, Moltmann was taken uh, as a prisoner of war. He was held in the POW camp in Scotland. That's where they began to show him the pictures of Auschwitz, the pictures of what the Germans had done. And he said, I was so 
ashamed. I didn't know any of this because I was so ashamed because I, I didn't even want to live anymore. Not just had my family been killed and not just had my friends been killed and everything had been taken from me, but now I realized that I would, I would be the scorn of the world because I was German. He said, I had nowhere to turn. I didn't know where to go. He said, I was just so empty inside. I felt completely abandoned. Somebody at the camp gave him a Bible. They handed him a Bible. He said, I started reading through it. He goes, I knew all the German poets, but he said, when I got to the Psalms, I found in David a kindred soul. I found somebody, these people were talking about their abandonment, how they had been chased, how they had lost everything. He said, I, I found for the first time I, someone had prayers that I could pray. So by the time I got to the Gospel of Mark and I got to that, that, one, that one line there at the end of Mark, when Jesus asks the last question, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said, when I read that, he said, for the first time, I knew why he had experienced that forsakenness. He said, it was for me. It was for me. He said, right then and there, I became a Christian and I decided I was gonna give my entire life to this man, Jesus, because I completely got what he was saying and where he was coming from. It's that last question. Jesus asks, Deborah and I were talking about this a couple of weeks ago and she said, I am convinced when I think of just the character of Jesus that what he experienced in that moment, no human has ever experienced. It's so easy to take for granted God's presence. But the answer to that question is you. It's you. It's so that you would feel that he has experienced abandonment. He knows how you feel. He knows where you hurt. He knows the loss. He loves you. He loves you. That's why. The question is the answer. We, we didn't need a voice from heaven booming down going, hey, you know, just hold on for a couple days. I'll be there and I'll rescue you. Right? No. In the darkness of that moment, and three days later, the father said, that's my son. And that kind of faith and that kind of trust, I will vindicate that and I will raise him up as victor, and every knee will bow to someone that had a faithful witnessing heart like my son. So what's your question? What question is God asking you? If there's one thing you could walk away from this service today with, it would, I, would, I would ask that it would be this, that you would know what God is saying to you, the question he's asking, statement he's making, the feeling that he's, you would know that and that you would know what you were gonna do about it. Would you stand with me? I came off that, came off that mountain and I wanted an answer to who is in and who is out, but God instead questioned me inside and out. I wanted an answer to who am I, but he questioned who are you going to become? I wanted an answer to what's out there. He wanted truth in the inward parts. I wanted proof of his existence. He wanted to give me the miracle of his presence. I wanted to get the facts straight. He wanted to purify my faith. I wanted answers, he wanted authenticity. I wanted control, he wanted trust. I wanted direction, he wanted character. I wanted to be known in the world, he wanted intimacy with me. I wanted power, he wanted brokenness. I wanted knowledge, he wanted me to know truth. I wanted life without death, he wanted me to, he wanted to show me life through death. I wanted answers, he wanted faith. 
So he turned my questions into quests and there he found me. Father, we stand in your presence here, grateful for scriptures that have been preserved for, in some cases, two, 3,000 years. And we hold in our hands precious words of God. Give us the heart to ask the right questions. Give us that questing spirit to not quit or stop, but to keep pursuing your presence in everything. Let us understand that all of our questions are meant to bring us into your presence. In your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, pleasures forevermore. Say this with me. Say, I am questing after God. He is my King. Jesus is Lord. I have nothing to fear. I am filled with faith. He goes before me and I follow behind. He is the fearless Lamb of God and I am the faithful follower. So powerful, so powerful. Can we just bless uh, Pastor Jeff for just... It's so sobering, so sobering when you think of personalities like many of us who are fixers and we like to be in control and the Lord is not the Lord of our life, we're the Lord of our lives. And, and, and you are confronted with that question he spoke about when the Lord said to Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? Where were you? That's powerful. If you would just bow your heads and close your eyes in this moment of reflection in this moment of reflection I, I want to bring up the very first question the Lord asked to mankind he said where are you I want you to think about that right now where are you and if we would be faithful to answer it I remember answering this question Lord I I don't even know how I got to where I am. And I've tried to fix myself. I, I've tried to cover myself. So Adam said, I try to cover myself and, and my covering is just insufficient because I'm still naked. I still have issues. Lord said, where are you? And if you're willing to say, Lord, I made some bad decisions. I've been away from you. It's just the truth, and I've tried to fix it, and, and I keep going on this cycle over and over again, but, but I'm just telling you, I'm making myself open and vulnerable to you, Lord God. I want you in my life, and, and he's such a loving father. He says, okay, son, okay, daughter, I, I, I'm, I'm going to cover you. And it's not going to be a temporary cover of leaves and the skin of, of a sacrificed animal. I'm ultimately going to cover you with the blood of my son. That way when I see you, I'm only going to see him. I'm going to wash away those sins. I'm going, to, I'm going to make you mine. That's what I want. If you're in this room, you say, I've just gone too far. I promise you, you haven't. I've done too much. I promise you, you haven't. Sir, if you're in this room right now and you say, Lord, I just never knew Jesus. And I just wanted to get my life right before I can come to him. I needed to be clean first. The truth is you can't get clean without him. He's saying, come to me, son. Come to me, daughter. Then maybe you're in this room and you grew up in church and you've just been away. You became the Lord of your life. Jesus says, make me Lord again. Make me Lord again. If that's you in this room and you need to know Jesus or you need to come back to him, if you would just lift your hand right where you are, we're going to pray for you. Right where you are. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Praise you, Jesus. I see that hand right here. Thank you, Lord God. Anybody else? I see that hand back there. Anybody else? Come on. I see those hands in the balcony. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. I see that hand right there. I see those hands. He's so welcoming. Thank you, God. I see those hands back there. Thank you, Lord God. Hey, Covenant Church, let's pray this prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, 
Thank you for your love for me. I acknowledge my sin. Please forgive me. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in me. Jesus, thank you for living for me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for rising for me. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, fill me now. From this day on, I am yours and you are mine. Be glorified in me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. He's so awesome. He's so awesome. This is the beginning of a journey. And we encourage you to dig into it and tell somebody quickly. Tell someone quickly what the Lord is doing in your life. And we're going to have our prayer team here at the altar. If you need prayer for anything, they are here for you. Uh, we would love for you to text SAVE to 54636. And that way we'll get a devotional to you for the next seven days because we're a family here at Covenant Church. We walk through things together. So we want to make sure that you have the right tools in your hand. If you're new to Covenant Church and you want to know more about us, there is a, a Next Steps desk in the lobby. We want to make sure that you um, to utilize that to get to know us a little bit. And hopefully you'll be back. And just a quick message from... Pastor Amy, Pastor Stacy, they miss you guys like crazy. It's like a torture for them. They they uh, recently uh, bought a house that needed some renovations, and they have the uh, the opportunity to move in this weekend. And uh, but they're thinking about you. And Pastor Amy will be here next week preaching at both campuses, and can't wait to share with you what the Lord uh, has given her for you. So it's going to be a blast. We look forward to seeing you next week. And as you enjoy this beautiful day, may the Lord bless you, and may He keep you. May May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may he cover you with his precious holy name, the name of Jesus. God bless you all. We'll see you soon.